We're back, Malignant Book Club. This is episode number three. And let's hope the focus actually works this episode. It's looking okay, but I can't tell for sure. Welcome back, episode number three. I'm joined by Dr. Timothy Olivier. Hi, Vinay. So Dr. Vinay Prasad is accepting to be his own journal book club. My yes, this is the, this is the this is the book club on Malignant. So where do we leave off? Chapter five. What are we going into? So chapter five um, is, <clears throat> I think, it's a really fascinating topic because we are, we will be going um, to talk about social <clears throat> forces, psychological forces, <clears throat> conflict of interest, and maybe we can start about um, hype in medicine. <clears throat> okay. So maybe you can just speak general things about hype and words that are used for um, in oncology. And after that, we'll get into some uh, more specific topics and some more specific works you did in the space. Okay. So I guess we're in part two of the book. This is called Societal Forces That Distort Cancer Medicine. And I was telling Timothy one day that uh, somebody once wrote to me, and you know who you are, that this is the part of the book that you should cut out. And I said, are you crazy? This is the most important part of the book. I have to say I really agree with the, you. The person I should cut uh, Okay. <laughs> you, you didn't pay me for yeah. that. Okay. I have no, so I have no financial conflict of interest. That's true. With, uh, with the I industry. I, yeah, and, and, and nor with me, because and, I don't pay you to and, work and, here and either. Yes. <laughs> um, I think it's a very important part, because I think it's explaining a lot of the issues ongoing in uh, oncology, maybe in medicine in general. There are some uh, <coughs> deep principles that are already beyond medicine, I think. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's really not a part to, to erase from the, the book, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the f chapter five is hype spin and the unbridled enthusiasm that distorts cancer medicine. And it starts with a quote from Shakespeare, oft expectation fails and most off there where it most promises. And I think that that's one of the big problems in cancer medicine, um, in particular, maybe biomedicine more broadly, but we'll talk about cancer medicine. Um, and what I would say is that uh, everybody is a salesperson. Everyone wants to sell themselves. The lab person who's working on some very um, basic blue skies biology, this person is making grandiose claims that they're going to solve cancer and cure cancer. Why are they doing that? They're trying to appease the donors and the grant funders. So they're saying things that are just patently untrue. Untrue if you knew the numerical law of uh, the probability that they're actually going to succeed. It's very low. That doesn't mean you shouldn't fund them. You should fund them. But it does mean that maybe they shouldn't embellish or exaggerate what they're capable of doing. Then we find, you know, from the moment somebody tries to spin out a compound into a company, everybody is hyping. They're hyping the early results. They're hyping the preclinical promise. They're trying to get venture capital money. They're hyping it when they sell it to the company. The company's hyping it so that it's a breakthrough designation. Even the term breakthrough designation has been workshopped by, you know, industry lobbyists to kind of give a favorable portrayal of the product. All the drugs are miraculous and game changers and cures. And, you know, we published on that. Um, and the reality is the average cancer drug, as I talked about in the first chapter, you know, improve survival two months. That's the average. Um, so yeah, that's something. That's a step forward, but it's a baby step. It's not a substantive leap. It's not a transformational change. And yet the rhetoric is out of out of whack. You know, when did you start being interested in this topic? It was um, in parallel with your other findings about some limitations <laughs> that we talked already about. Or at the beginning of your fellowship, you, you referred that um, what was the story of that? Yeah, I think I was at a conference. Uh, you know, my first year fellowship was 2012, and that year we're not allowed. Oh, actually, maybe I, I did go to ASCO that year. Um, second year and third year, I went for sure. It was one of those first few ASCOs I went to where I was sort of inundated with. I mean, you go to ASCO, and it's like everything is amazing and revolutions and hype, hype, hype. And this was honestly, this was pre-Twitter. I mean, Twitter hadn't yet exploded to what it is today. Now it's even worse. Am I wrong? It's even worse. Everyone is constantly, if you look at Onco Twitter, it's nothing but hype, endless hype. And it's hype from the PIs, from the companies, from the investigators. Um, it's also hype from the journals. It's also hype from these, these sort of rag publications that make a living, you know, doing sort of quote unquote news stories about, you know, the paper. I mean, I, it's not even news because news has to have some objectivity and critical thinking that doesn't exist. And uh, so I got turned on to it pretty early. Okay. So maybe <clears throat> I think what is, I think is really interesting is uh, maybe it, it can, it can feel a bit general, like you, you speak like that, but you really deep in specific topics. Um, the first work you can talk about um, is the work when you um, look at superlatives, mm, superlatives yeah. in Google News, and <coughs> you, you just look at this, and I think it's really important because it's not just general. You, you, you add data on that. Yeah, and I think this was work done with, if I recall, Matt Abola, 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, who is a, was a star? You know, I think I was introduced to him by my my colleague Bapu Jenna from Harvard. We worked on some stuff together, and he did this paper on superlatives. It was a very simple, straightforward thing where he, you know, systematically search the news for cancer drug in concert with one of 10 pre-specified terms. And if I remember, I won't remember them all, miracle, game changer, revolution, cure, home run, something like that. These kind of, you know, too good to be true terms, often too good to be true. Um, rarely they are true, but often too good to be true. And what he found was a big set of drugs. I mean, you would easily find lots and lots of drugs where people were using this kind of lofty rhetoric. Um, half of those drugs had not been FDA approved. 14% had only been tested in mice. Um, that's pretty bad to call a drug that's only been given to a mouse, a game changer, a miracle in, in the press. This is not press meant for mouse researchers. This is the lay press. This is what people are reading. Unbelievable. I think another finding here was interesting. It's third in 30%, roughly 30% of time. It was, uh, quoted from physician themselves. Oh, right. The doctor is um, doing it. So, yeah. and, and we'll I get forgot, yeah. on that. Sometimes on next, journalists, yeah, sometimes yeah. doctors, yeah, yeah. and sometimes Congress, even one congressperson, right? And um, now we can move. It's a kind of same work you did on the word unprecedented. <coughs> I think this is interesting because it's a more precise word. Yeah. And it was uh, roughly uh, the same methodology. And your findings is also uh, comparable, but even even more interesting, I think. I think I was at an ASCO where someone po put a hazard ratio up in a, in a disease, and I don't want to say what. And they said, this is unprecedented unprecedented benefit unprecedented benefit i said unprecedented and then i said that literally means without a precedent no one has ever had a hazard ratio so low in that disease and then i said to myself hmm i wonder if i can think of i, I thought of one study real quick i wonder what the hazard ratio i, I look it up from like four years ago it the hazard ratio was better uh so i said okay come on it is precedented it had a precedent so maybe the second, but it's not unprecedented. And in that investigation, I think we looked at the term unprecedented in a big scope, and we asked how often was it in fact precedented? And you may know better than me because it's been so, a long time. What were so the numbers? Hal half were not FDA approved. I mean, same oh, findings. Half were not FDA approved, and sure. And 4% were, uh, were never used in human, so not 14, but 4%. And I think here what, is what, <coughs> what was more interesting is that um, I think almost half was reported by physicians themselves, mm. even more than for um, uh, superlatives. I see, yes. Yeah. And then the last point is that some of the times that they use, I forget the exact number, but many times they said it was unprecedented, we could find a precedent. Yeah, so in, in half of the study, study, you could find a, random, a randomized trial, and in those, I think it was only 40% that were really unprecedented. unprecedented yeah. yeah. So and, and if anything, that's going to be biased because we, we looked so hard, but we didn't look as hard as we could have. But you're right. So the, the truth is 60% of the time we could find a randomized trial with a better point estimate. That's not unprecedented. That's precedented. I think it's good because we have some um, uh, specific data. It's not <laughs> just we are talking about hype, but these are, these are real data you, you find. Um, you study also the word cure. I mm -hmm. think this is also <clears throat> an interesting example because, and w maybe we'll come to that later, why there is uh, all this hype, maybe it's because also the, the specific nature of cancer and the specific uh, um, disease and the prognosis that is uh, going with, with cancer. So cure, you, you did also uh, work on, on that, that specific word. Yeah, you know? I remember. Uh, so I think I was a fellow at the time and someone said, you know, we're, we're getting close to curing this disease. And I, I said, what, excuse me? I said, I didn't, that's news to me, you're curing. And then I said, well, you know, when people hear the word cure, what does it mean? And I did a lot of digging trying to get to the bottom of it because I was curious. And um, what I found was that it's actually been defined rather elegantly, I think, in the 1950s, 60s by Eason Russell. And their cure was something that, like, I think we'll all agree on. What is a cure? You go to the doctor's office. They tell you, you know, you have a disease. But I have a cure. What is a cure? Well, it's a fixed course of therapy. I think that's key. Like, we're going to have to treat you for some time. And after you finish the fixed course of therapy, you'll have the same survival as an age sex-matched control who didn't have the disease. So you finish the course of therapy, and we say you're cured, and then your likelihood of living a long and good life is as good as if you never had the disease. So that's the definition, Eason and Russell definition of cure. Um, and then I got curious when I looked in the biomedical literature to say, if you could survey the biomedical literature very broadly, systematically, and pull out every time someone says they got a cure, and ask how often do they actually adhere to this definition, or do they adhere to a different definition? And the answer was, I think, only you know one in one in three. Yeah, you selected. But I think that was interesting because you selected based on the title. So they use cure yes, in yes, the title. Yes, very provocative. Yes, just in one in three, they were using correctly the the, the word cure. 
Um, and also you find that in half of them, they were using um, this word in an uncurable setting. Yes. And I think the, one of the themes that runs through this is that I'm interested, of course, in studying these phenomenon, but as you point out, not rhetorically, I'm interested in studying it empirically, quantifying it, measuring it, documenting it. And I think that that has been, you know, that's one of the strengths of the book is that the book is resting on many, many quantified studies and analyses. Maybe you can talk some um, general thing about, um, you know, many times you hear about this inflection point. Um, we have a lot of these Maybe this is going beyond the book, but I know you're interested in that. You have a lot of this war against cancer, um, all this, all this retho rhetoric and um, inflection, inflection point. Can you talk about that very maybe generally? Uh, what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I'm not a fan. I mean, I think, and by the end of the book, you will see. I'm, I'm the advocate for more cancer funding, more blue skies funding, more research funding. I'm the advocate for more, not less. So that's my starting point. But we cannot use false rhetoric to kind of achieve what we want. We can't sell people on a lie. And the lie that we're always curing cancer, the lie that every new thing is unprecedented, it's a lie because it's empirically not true. Um, and you see that in the war on cancer. War on cancer was a marketing slogan developed in the 1970s to, uh, for Richard Nixon's war on cancer, and it allowed a lot of science funding. But you know, when John Bylar wrote his summary in the New England Journal in, I think, the 80s or early 90s, um, it had largely failed. It had largely not met the expectations. Uh, you, you can't do that. I mean, you can't keep setting unrealistic sights and unrealistic goals. You know, I was critical of Biden's moonshot in the Washington Post in 2016, I think, um, because it also had a lot of unrealistic rhetoric. Uh, cancer is not one disease. It's many. Uh, it will not be cured by a single magic bullet. Uh, it will not be cured in our lifetimes, I think, realistically. It will be a slow, arduous, uphill climb. You know, we've done so much work mapping market share of genome therapies, et cetera. I know. This is a slow, steady slog of a growth. Um, you need to fund science not because it always pays off. You fund science because it occasionally, rarely pays off, but when it pays off, it pays off big. And the other reason you fund science is it's the only way of knowing. It's either science or, or total ignorance, total foolishness. Now, I think, you know, in the pandemic, we have seen there are a lot of people who think they practice science. They don't practice anything close to science. They are close to rhetorical science. Science is rhetoric. Science is not rhetoric. It's a way of knowing things. You must fund science and basic science. You need to do it in a, in a fair way, in a way that doesn't, you know, we have so many, we can talk about this in the, in the final chapters, but the last thing I'd say is this. In our current system, we have created a lot of money managers, people who run great big laboratories who are really good at, you know, getting grants. I don't know if they're good at science. I don't know if they're the best at science. I know there are a lot of great scientists who don't have a shot because of the way in which the money flows through the system. And the people who are good at accumulating massive capital and running 20, 30, 40, 60 person labs, they're good at talking some, you know, some BS, some hype, some, some, some spin. That's what they're good at. Are they good at science? Sometimes, yeah, but not always. They don't go hand in hand. Okay, I think, I think yes, the point is interesting because there is a lot of subjectivity in all these words. Yeah. And, um, and I think this is uh, different from scientific finding in a way. And maybe we can illustrate this with a, a next, um, a next uh, topic you talk about is spin, the word mm. spin. Um, these are works that have been made by colleagues. And uh, can you explain? Uh, because now we are moving maybe from the press release, from specific words. But what is spin? Um, and is it frequent? And why it matters? Yeah, so this is a space that uh, I give credit to people who did this work before me. I think Tanuk and Vera Badillo and others who have done sort of the, the work on spin. And spin is basically you know, hype is sort of exaggerating your finding and spin is taking something that's real, but sort of portraying it as favorably as possible, emphasizing secondary endpoints over primary endpoints. These kinds of games that get played, um, they're ways to sort of, you know, kind of, kind, of, kind of fudge it a little bit, make it look a little bit more appetizing. And, you know, spin is ubiquitous. Um, and I forget all their studies, but I think they've done studies where they rewrite I, abstract with or without spin. And yeah, see if I think yeah, uh, huh? this, this was really interesting because when they, they took 30 abstract with spin, and they rewrote, rewrote them uh -huh. in, uh, without spin, and they, they submitted to 300 doctors, and they found that they were more likely to think that the, um, the study was beneficial. If it had spin yeah, in it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they just prove it. And uh, I think it's also pointing that we are human, we have psychology, we have um, uh, feelings, behave, uh, beliefs, all, all that kind of thing. So 
I think that's why, why this work on hype, spin, the words are, is very important. I think it's so key. I mean, you can see right now many good scientists, excellent scientists, and even lay people when it comes to the pandemic, they believe things that are just not plausible, not possible, not consistent with empiricism or science. And they have ardent beliefs that that's true. People are heavily influenced by, I think, um, the way in which it's presented to them, how the media covers something. Even a scientist who you think ought to be able to read the paper, they're heavily influenced by the media coverage of it. Many of them are reading the media coverage and not the paper itself. Many of us are influenced, and I'm sure I'm influenced by this too, how things are presented to me, um, how, how the packaging appears, um, how it's formatted. Um, you know, These things have huge psychological influence, and the industry has exploited it in doctors. Um, oncology training is rigorous. It's very hard, um, but it's hard in a lot of things. They throw you in the deep end in sort of the, um, the patient discussion. That's tough. They throw you in the deep end in like, oh, heroes about, you know, a couple thousand diseases you need to learn and memorize all the treatments and all the randomized studies for. But they don't, and they throw you in the deep end on molecular biology, how the drugs work and all this stuff. But what they don't do, what they universally fail to do, one of the reasons I wrote the book, is they don't give you the tools to actually like read and interpret articles impartially and avoid being susceptible to spin. They don't give you that tool, that toolkit. Um, and that's really bad. That makes you so vulnerable when you're out there in the community practicing. I would say, and, and you tell that I think the net, next chapter also, it's um, natural, naturally appealing uh, to, you know, to want to give some hope, <coughs> to, want to, to want to say that your results are maybe more, more, more beneficial than that they are really are. I mean, it's, it's pretty natural. Yeah. So I think that's why it's important to know that, just to be aware of that, that every, everybody, including yourself, you, you can be uh, susceptible to that kind of um, bias. As uh, proof of that is every once in a while I see someone, uh, you know, someone in my day-to-day -day life and they're like right in front of me, I see them kissing up to the senior person, like really kissing up, laying it on thick. And I'm like, oh my God. Mm. I was like, surely this is obvious to everyone that this is kissing up. But I mm. always see mm. the senior person loves it. They're always so happy. Oh, yeah. They love it. They love it being buttered up. <laughs> you, you say that. They always love it. You say that in the book. Do I say I, that? Yeah, yeah, you say that oh, in the God, book. I, remember, so I think in the next chapter. Yeah, yeah, you say that. So predictable. Um, uh, you say that. <laughs> no, you say that the flattery. Flattery, even, yeah. even if you know that it is flattery. Is insincere. It, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, working in a way. Um, in this chapter, you, you go in many other examples. I, I, I just, um, I, we, we won't get uh, on every, every aspect of it. Maybe the last thing I find it very interesting, and it's uh, recall with the introduction, um, when, you take, when you talk about 20 new story, one patient. No, and I, I think it's interesting because it's what you said at the, at the first part. The history of medicine is often um, omitting a large part of the stories. Can you just expand on that? No, uh, something that I, I, I can't tell you who, but maybe when they retire, I'll tell you. It was a very senior person who's been doing healthcare reporting a long time, and we were talking about these issues, and then the senior person told me, you know, I always say, I always tell reporters that um, uh, the drug that you got to have a lot of, you got to raise a lot of doubt about is if the, the, the people who are developing the drug, they can bring out one person who had a great response, but there are 20 news stories about that one person and a drug that really works, there's 20 people who had a great response and there may be one news story about it. And, and that, I think that's key, which is that, you know, even failed drugs, I remember at the NIH, we had a bunch of drugs that are not on the US market right now, but there was one person who we thought had a really good response to that. And, you know, we'll talk about it in the book, I think, do I get into exceptional super responders in that work? Yeah, yeah, okay. but, uh, maybe. In, that's I like think, in the yeah, third yeah, part or yeah. fourth part. So. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is, there's this issue and that issue is a denominator issue, which is like good things. You need to know how many people get treated and how many people benefited. And um, people, there, there's all sorts of things that can influence an individual case. One could be um, uh, concomitant therapies, therapies that were administered uh, early or late, uh, or, that, or with it, uh, that, that resulted in it. The other thing is like, you know, indolent biology. It could also be one of the factors, you know, indolent biology and, um, and, uh, and not the drug effect. And also, I think, as you said, it, it may be the drug effect, but to appraise uh, to appraise the effect, you have to have all stories, not just one. And I think it's the same thing with um, reversals. Uh, you have to you have to have the, the whole picture, not just one story, not just one randomized trial. Uh, I think this is related to this point. Yeah. Conclusion about this chapter. What what is? I think we already get on onto that. But 
why it is uh, so important this um, this topic i mean it's a good question i guess i would say that i don't know the fir the first part of the book is trying to show you cost value benefit funding it's all misaligned and the third part of the book is going to get into the weeds on crossover and control arms and all and, and all the things we've been working on and like why the evidence base is flawed and if you read those two parts without this part, you'd be like, what, what is, what is going on? Like, wh why? These are smart people. What is going on? Like, why are they bending over backwards to praise a drug with a 1% IDFS when you know IDFS doesn't even correlate with OS in breast? You know that? And you know this, this drug has 40% grade, grade two diarrhea, 40%, and they're praising it so, and it costs 200,000, what, are they smarter? Is some, am I missing something? And, and, and the whole point of this section is to say, here's what you're missing. You're missing the fact that we are drowning in a sea of hype. I mean, we just published this thing with Emma Greenstreet, um, who's a medical student here at UCSF. She looked at oncology podcasts, and I asked her to pull all the oncology podcasts, and they listened in duplicate, and they basically said, who's on these oncology podcasts? And this will bleed into the other chapters. The people on these podcasts are like heavily conflicted investigators. They have tons of money in their own pocket. We're not talking about research funds and money in their own pocket from the companies. They're always praising the drugs. They're celebrating all these drugs. They're uncritically parroting things. You know, when I, when we point out things like, oh, the post-protocol therapy on your control arm was negligent, they say, oh, you know, well, in the real world, people don't get appropriate care. Um, uh, uh, and then they cite some study of like very old and frail patients. I say, this isn't an old, these aren't old and frail patients. These are very young, healthy people you've put on your trial. These people in your own clinic would get better care than that on the control arm you know that you know that's true why are you telling me this you know you're telling me something that i know you know is false why and that's this this is the part Vinay, maybe i will um, yeah. i will uh, temper you, it yeah temper it. because you, you say that at the end of the next chapter i think you, you said that <coughs> finally uh, most of people are, are acting in good faith of I course think, yeah. i think this is uh, also an important thing in in those chapters there's the incentives that are playing a huge role and we'll d describe them also with a conflict of interest. And, uh, yeah, and uh, let me make that clear about my comments now. I, I don't always think that they are actively and maliciously thinking through this. This is the way the incentives have shaped their behavior. They're acting in this way. It is exactly what I say it is. It is kind of con internally contradictory and it makes no sense. But they are being shaped by powerful incentives that distort their own thinking. They're not even privy to those incentives. And one of the things is, you know, from the moment you decide you want to be an oncology fellow um, and you start immersing yourself in oncology, all you hear is bombastic rhetoric, bombastic rhetoric of how good these drugs are, how amazing they are, what they're going to accomplish. Um, it's hard later then to have an object, objective reference, objective point of view about these drugs. And I think it's also pretty rare so you are you are a minority if you if you hold that views you're a minority and uh let's just say there's not a lot of grant funding in this minority okay <laughs> on that positive note <laughs> on that positive note should we move to the next chapter do yeah, we have time we got time let's do the next yeah. chapter so the next chapter will just be a kind of uh, diagnosis if <coughs> i can say that about the conflict of interest um you you will just describe how much doctors uh, receive payments, the average payments. Um, <coughs> we, we can go through through that. Um, I guess one thing I want to say before we start mm -hmm. is that this is a chapter on conflict of interest. What does that mean? There's a conflict in your interest when you take money from some things, but not other things. So let's say, for instance, you, Timothy, you're an oncologist, a medical oncologist. You see patients, you prescribe drugs. I happen to also know you play the piano. Uh, let's say, for instance, on the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, you took up a job where you're going to go play piano and people are going to pay you some money to hear you play piano. Uh, is that a conflict with your other job? And the answer, no. no. Right. I mean, you can go play piano, you know, whatever you want to play. It has nothing to do with prescribing. Um, the moment you start taking money from entities in the biopharmaceutical space that have a unidirectional arrangement with products, that's when the conflicts come. The key thing is unidirectional. Celgene only makes money from selling Revlimid. They don't make money from shorting Revlimid. Okay. Um, they, they have a specific product. And that product is a product that you prescribe or you advocate for, you interpret the data for. And this creates a very tight, tough conflict of interest. Yeah, it's not just about uh, how much money you receive. It's, it's about the, the relation. It's about the relation. Yeah. It's not just about the money. For instance, some people say, oh, well, now you have a conflict. You're getting rich writing malignant. And I say... <laughs> Is it, is it true? 
Is it true? I, I was like, I, to be honest, if you add up the hours I spent on it and the amount I've earned, I think it's about a dollar an hour, like one dollar per hour spent. Which, by the way, I have better ways I could I could make I could do better if I take a few moonlighting shifts. So it's uh, you know it's not the money. Second of all, what's the unidirectionality of *Malignant*? Let me point that out. Malignant, *Malignant* is a book that's I think heavily critical of the current system, but it didn't have to be. You know, I could have written a book that was a, a bombastic book that hero worships oncology. In fact, there, there, I don't know if you know this, there are a few such books, bombastic, you know, inaccurate histories that hero worship, and they sell really good. They sell much better than Malignant. So you can write that book. You can also write a book that's critical of sort of the entrenched interest in oncology. Um, but neither person has a conflict, to be honest with you, because you can write a book pro or anti the industry, critical or, or acquiescing to bad data interpretation, and 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 there's no unidirectionality to it. But but Celgene doesn't make money from not selling Revlimid. You know, I think that's a key structural thing people miss. People miss that in 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 every space. They think that somebody's conflicted because money was exchanged. If you played piano on the weekend, money would be exchanged, but you wouldn't be conflicted. I think we have to understand what the conflict means. Before going into yeah. the data, you you made an important distinction between general payments and research payments, because <coughs> we will mainly focus on general payments. But maybe can you briefly explain that, and after that we will just describe. I mean the, the state uh, of uh, conflict in, of interest. interest. Yeah. So I guess um, I have always tried to uh, focus on general payments. Research payments are money that the companies pay to institutions, not investigators. Now, to be perfectly honest, these do indirectly benefit investigators. You can put some of your salary time on the research grant. These research grants, when they expire, they often have huge sums of money left. Senior people can roll over those sums over and over again until they have multi-million dollar slush funds that they use for business travel and having many assistants and sort of a lavish lifestyle. Um, so they do can indirectly benefit the person. But for the sake of this, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that most of those payments are used for actually doing the research. And that is the nature of the current research system. And although I'd like to make some changes. Uh, so I'm not really going to judge people harshly for that, or I'm not going to look at that so focused. General payments are money that people pay directly to you, Timothy. You go on a weekend and you talk about, you go on a Wednesday and you talk about, uh, you know, a drug ad, ad board, uh, advisory board. You give them your opinion, um, which I always find interesting because, you know, some of these companies, you look at the senior vice president. The senior vice president was recently hired from the academy and maybe like the single most distinguished lung cancer investigator in a quarter century, as some companies just hired, the, like the best lung cancer investigator, the guy who knows everything. He knows everything, every trial. He's brilliant. I've read his papers. He's brilliant. That's the guy who's the vice president. But then they get an ad board where they get somebody just one year out of fellowship um, to advise them on how to develop the drug. Interesting. I mean, yes, it's possible the person one year out of fellowship is adding something. It's possible, sure. But it's also possible that they're giving them the money to build that connection, to build that warmth. Just like when you go to someone's house, I you see. present them, you know, you present them a, bo a bottle of wine, a peace offering, just like the Hare Krishna at the airport gives you the flower, then asks for the donation. These are ways in which we've always, you know, made nice with people. So those yeah. are the payments I focus on. Yeah. So and we will go into the the, the relation of receiving uh, such uh, such money and how can it modify your <coughs> behavior. I think this is really important. So how much so how much money receive physician in oncology? First, the, the percentage <coughs> of um, general doctors that <coughs> receive money, uh, roughly describe it that it's more than half of them in the percentage. And um, the average is uh, not so, I mean, yeah. can you comment on the average? I mean, yeah, that's a nice way to frame it. I guess what I would say is there are parts of this book that will be timeless, and there are other parts that are already kind of getting dated. <laughs> and this, I mean, I hate to say it might be one of those parts um, because the, the payments have just gone up and up. You know, they just go up with time. But I guess at the time the book was written, and I think I'm using like 2015, 16 data, um, you know, what we're talking about is if you look at like all oncologists, I think, you know, maybe 50% had a conflict, but the average conflict was a few hundred bucks. But as you rise up the ranks to the highest echelons of who controls the, the flow charts that lead to prescribing patterns. Can you, can, you talk, can you talk about that? Yeah. So then like the average oncologist, you know, it's like 50% and a few hundred bucks. The oncologists who are tweeting about drugs, it's like, I don't know, seven. I think this is the paper, Derek Tao, um, who's going to be a oh, first year fellow at MD Anderson. He was a medical student. He did this paper for me. Um, Derek Tao, brilliant guy, uh, going to Anderson. And he um, found that it was like 60 or 70% of people who are tweeting have a conflict, and the conflict's like a thousand bucks. And then you go even higher, and some people have looked at the NCCN, the people who write the guidelines. And by the way, we'll talk about their compendia too, which means they obligate Medicare to pay. 
those people, it's like 85%, it's like 10 grand. And so like, and then when you look at the people who like run the cancer center, they're like knee deep in cash. So like, as you go and have more influence over how people prescribe, the industry happens to give you more money. And they're not talking about research money. I'm talking about money in your pocket per annum. And, you know, we did a paper with Allison um, Haslam and Jenny Gill and I and JAMA Internal Medicine, where we found that for a fraction of these people who happen to work at public universities where we know their salary, we're talking about people making 20% of their salary through consulting per year and some people doubling their salary through consulting per year. You can go pull the percentages from that paper. I mean, doubling your salary. And by the way, your salary is already four times the average household income in this country. Now you're going up to eight times or 10 times the average household income in this country per annum consulting for these companies. This is a lot of money. I mean, this is not, this is not chump change. By the way, if you gave me this kind of money, I wouldn't be here on this video. No. <laughs> I wouldn't be here talking. I am. Hey, listen, do um, something else. So if I get, if I get it right, yes. um, the majority, uh, more than half of doctors receive payments, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's average. It's, uh, as you said, a few hundred bucks, probably but, a couple of as you, as you go up, you, yeah. you receive more. Um, why the NCCN guidelines are important just for the listeners to understand, because I think it's, it's linked to what Medicare reimbursed. So I think this is one important thing. Yeah. So in the 1990s, there was an act called the Medicare Omnibus Reconciliation Act, and it actually said that Medicare, for certain categories of medications, um, we're going to make it easy for you, Medicare. We're going to get some experts to put out guidelines, and these guidelines uh, are more formally called compendia, and it will actually instruct you under what circumstances do you pay for certain drugs. And it was really kind of useful back in the day because, for instance, platinum or doxyrubicin was an old generic drug. It didn't always have a drug approval in every single indication we like to give it for. We need somebody to tell me when it's acceptable to use doxyrubicin when it isn't. And so the compendia was created, and there are all these drug guidelines. A few years later, NCCN lobbied heavily to be added as one of the compendia that Medicare would use. And the moment it got inserted, you know, the domino started to fall. Any 2A or higher recommendation in NCCN obligates, obligates Medicare to pay. They got to pay 2A or higher, even if it's not approved, they got to pay. They can't negotiate price. They are over a barrel. They got to pay up. And the moment that happened, that's when you had a huge incentive that if you are a company and you have your drug and you want people to use it, you can get an approval or you can get Medicare, you can get the NCCN to add it as 2A or higher, and then you're going to get a lot of cash. Uh, go on. Yeah, I, I think you you give the example of uh, Aaron Mitchell work. Yes, and this is a really striking example. So it uh, among <laughs> the NCCN guidelines experts, eighty four percent had a conflict. Had a conflict, and, 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 and the average number is ten grand or higher. Ten grand or yeah, higher. Yeah, yeah. So I think this really make the the distinction between the average doctors and other doctors that have really a huge impact and prescription on how many decisions. And I have to disclose one thing. Yeah. Uh, how much money have I taken from some pharmaceutical companies in the seven years I've been in attending and the three years I was a fellow before then and the three years I was a resident before then? And the answer is zero dollars. And I have given two lectures or more lectures. No, more than two. More Actually, mul mul more, actually more than I can actually count. Um, at pharmaceutical firms and a few in person and some keynotes at pharmaceutical companies. Um, and, what, and, 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 I, and I paid my own way. I paid my own airplane ticket. I paid my yeah. own hotel. I paid my own meal. Le so I, let me ask yeah, the, yeah. the personal question here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, because in each episode, you will find some personal question. <laughs> okay. Um, because uh, as you said, we are in a system. We, we, with uh, all these payments, you see all your colleagues you see, uh, when you are a student, when you are a fellow. So what makes you decide not to receive any money from the industry? I mean, because it's not so, <coughs> it's not so often. It's not so frequent. Uh, I don't know, maybe with your colleagues, or w w did you realize that it was a problem? How did you realize that at that time? This is interesting to me. Yeah, I guess, I guess uh, for the first few years in oncology, nobody offered me any money. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that, that's no, nobody, nobody offered me any money. Um, but that wasn't it. I think, I think I very quickly, and to be honest, you read Any Medical Reversal. Even in, when I read yeah. that book, there's stuff on conflict of interest there. I think early in my career, I had been reading enough. I read Martha Angel's Truth About Drug Companies. I read, um, uh, um, uh, what are the other great books in that space? Um, uh, about, the, about, about being detailed. Oh, I know, Jerry Avorn's book. Um, Jerry Avorn's book, oh, I'm blanking on the title, but it was brilliant. 
the books by Goldacre were really terrific. I had read so many books in the space. I was already kind of cognizant that this is a potential bias. Um, I had read the, the sort of the broader meta-analytic reviews of conflict of interest. That's the other point I want to make is that unlike other biases, conflict has been quantified across meta-analytic estimates of many, many studies, in part because it's easy to measure, but it's a very, very clear bias. There are other biases, sure, but this is a known bias, and it would be like ignoring con financial conflict or interest would be like ignoring tobacco smoke, thinking there are other carcinogens out there. Yeah, there are other carcinogens, but that's a known and important carcinogen. Anyway, back to your question. So I sort of had an intuition, and then I quickly in my oncology career when I was a fellow, I kind of, and by the, oh, I worked at NIH. When you're at NIH, you are prohibited by law from- Okay, interesting, yeah. Yeah, you're prohibited by law from taking any money. Also, nobody would offer a fellow any, I mean, back then they wouldn't. Now maybe they would. Actually, things have changed a little bit. Um, but by the time I matured and became a faculty, I had already sort of had sort of a zero financial conflict policy. Um, I do do some things now that consulting for different firms, but I always position it in a way where that my work is, there's no unidirectionality to my work. I think this is the part that people don't understand is that like I, um, the, the entities are not profiting from doing more or doing less. We're just trying to do objectively the right things. And if I felt that there was a tension there and that it could feed back to my work, I would not do it. And I declined a lot of opportunities that way. Um, but I do think that, um, I don't know, these things tie together. I mean, it's, you said it's a personal question, but let me say, um, we were talking recently about somebody we know, a mutual acquaintance, and this person has a lot of discipline. You kept saying, you use the word discipline. Yeah. Okay, discipline, this person's discipline is they are very exacting in what they eat and drink. They exercise a lot. Um, I must admit as a personality trait, you know, now you know me a little bit, I have some discipline in some things when it comes to like exercise, when it comes to um, this kind of stuff. And so I think for me, the moment I realized the potential downside implications of biopharmaceutical conflict, I incorporated it into the things that I was going to be um, disciplined about. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you very much for answering that. Um, the last example in this chapter is um, really interesting. Maybe you can go a bit fast on that, but I think the patient av advocate is interesting. And you, you speak about the ODAC table where page, patient oh, advocate. Yeah. Advocate. But maybe maybe just patient advocate uh, patient advocate because <laughs> I think patient advocacy most people maybe d doesn't know that um, there are also problems with conflict of interest in that space. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing about patient advocacy that we forget is that everyone whose lives have been touched by cancer and their loved ones are all patient advocates. You know, we've advocated for, I, 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 I don't want to get too personal, but you know, we've all had people in our families who have suffered from cancer and we became advocates for that person. So we're, I think I think almost almost uh, maybe maybe the majority of Americans have someone in their immediate family that they has been an advocate or considers themselves an advocate. But if you look at the people who are identified as advocates who participate in advocacy organizations, it's a much more limited set of people, um, and they participate with organizations, patient advocacy organizations, and in that set of people, the financial conflicts are vast. We did a paper, I think, in Mayo Clinic Proceedings where we found like two-thirds or three-quarters of patient advocacy organizations recommended by NCCN three-quarters three yeah, yeah. were taking money from pharma, taking money from pharma, which is, you know, they have to find a way to sustain themselves, yes. But if you take so much money from pharma and you're an advocate, you're always advocating for more drugs, new drugs, but can you advocate for lower prices? And others have pointed out that they almost never advocate for lower prices. It's always access and insurance coverage and low copay. But it's not lower price, lower premium. It's not lower premium, lower spending. It's not better drugs. It's more drugs. It's not higher regulatory standards. It's lower. You know, it's, it's a real conflict with the industry. And to be honest, the industry and patients are have some antagonistic relationship because patients are getting gouged by some of these drugs. They're getting gouged. We've seen people with horrible copays who struggle to decide if they want to pay for the drug. Um, can you expand a bit on that, uh, on the, the misalignment, misalignment, misalignment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, between the industry and doctors yeah. uh, or patient interest? And I think this is something that I point out, which is that, um, yes, like being a pharmaceutical firm and being a, uh, doing what's best for patients, they're two vectors in space. And there's a huge overlap. Like pharmaceutical firms do make more money if they develop products that are life extending, life prolonging, um, you know. They have many successes. Look at Gleevec, look at trastuzumab. But there's some misalignment. 
you know, sometimes it's better to develop, you know, a me too drug, a formulation to take the S enantiomer and separate it from the R enantiomer and sell that as a new product to have a long patent life, to patent your REMS, like with, cell, with, the, with the pomalidomide and lenalidomide, to do all these kind of tactics to maximize your profits, even though it might be the expense of what's best for people. And the purpose of thoughtful drug regulation and the purpose of chap the part four of the book is to bring those two vectors even closer together so that we encourage the, the, the tiger to be a tiger, the pharmaceutical company, to be ferocious, but I point your ferocity in the direction I want. Right now, you're ferocious, but you're a little bit out of my control. Sometimes your ferocity bites my hand. I don't want that. I want to bring you into control. The purpose of regulation is to make their incentive what's best for everybody, but that's not the way it is right now. And go ahead. No, um, I think we we conclude on this chapter. I don't know if we have time to go to the other chapter. We can keep that for, for next, next time. time. Next time. Uh, next time, we'll understand why all these conflicts matter. I think this is a, uh, these are two related chapters. We, we made the, the kind of diagnosis or the state, state, state of uh, um, conflict, conflict of interest in oncology. But in the next part, we will go into the um, why it matters. And the solution you proposed, um, I don't think they are easy to, to implement, but uh, you proposed some. I think the last thing I'd say is that um, you know, in, in, the in the chapters that follow and in the work we've been doing, we are, you know, I think we're the ones who mapped out a lot of these things like crossover. There are two types of crossover. There are errors of omission and errors of inclusion. Um, control arm quality, so many papers on that. Post-protocol therapy you're going to publish very soon. Physician choice. Uh, physician choice. When they call it a physician choice, it's not an unfettered choice. That's work by Timothy Olivier. Censoring, informative censoring. We're going to do some stuff. On, we're going to talk about some quality of life stuff. We're going to talk about um, uh, 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 small underpowered phase two trials and erroneous conclusions. We're going to talk about all of these things that are like, it's like Journal Club 101 stuff. Like, how do you be a really good Journal Club reader? And I'm, we're going to give you everything. Like, I think this book really does get into everything that I hear people talking about. There are a few things we don't get into in the book, but that's because we haven't published them yet. But we're about to publish it. We're going to publish that soon. So we get into all this stuff. And then you might be like, well, oh boy, there's so many problems in these trials, so many problems. But what was the root of all these problems? What's the root of these problems? This is the root. This section is the root of the problems. The problems exist because the incentives are misaligned. Yes, they're good actors, but you know, all human beings will follow incentives. We need to align the incentives. The problems are there because the media environment around this is just saturated with hype and is really sort of missing the mark from reality. And I find even my, my colleagues that you and I both know who are some of the most critical about drugs, um, sometimes they still embrace very unproven regimens. Because again, you know, how much can you ask for someone marinating in a culture of hype? Even when they sort of go against the grain, they're still very much, I think, away from the truth, you know, whatever that may be. Okay, so I... I will say it, but uh, on that positive note. <laughs> <laughs> That's the catchphrase of the podcast. So uh, thank you, Timothy, I think, I, I think for doing the, these. I think th what is really interesting to me is yeah. um, to understand that we are all humans and um, there's all these uh, incentives sometimes that are very deep also because I think some doctors, you know, just want to, to praise, to, to give hope. I mean, I mean, sometimes it's really in, in, in goodwill, as you said. Um, but to be aware of that, I think it's really important to be more tr trustworthy uh, for patients and in general. And um, on that positive note. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing we'll say is we might try to do one more of these episodes. You're going to go back to Europe for a little bit and come back. And so there might be a delay. Uh, I appreciate you doing this. We have not coordinated. This is blind. And actually, it's so blind that I'm so late, I'm so busy lately that I haven't even reviewed the books. I forgot, like this is all I think this is, this is good time. because it's a very, you know, spontaneous, so, <laughs> so and I, 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 I took some notes and, uh, uh, but also it's your general thinking about all these issue and uh, that's, that's great. I think it's changed a little bit and the world of Zoom has, has hardened me, but yeah, I think, I, think it, I think we need to focus on the systems. That's the key. Okay, until next time, this is part three. Uh, yeah. And next time, part four. Thanks for tuning in.